The brewing of beer and the breeding of horses are two of man's most ancient and fundamental skills. And they both require patience. Man can initiate and innovate, but then he must wait. Time must pass before beer is ready to be drunk or a young horse put to work. It may well be for these reasons that horses seem to suit the pace of life on a hop farm and that breweries still use horses alongside modern machinery. It's not so very long ago that the same horses and carts that carried hops to the oast houses also went to the railway stations to collect the tens of thousands of cockney hop pickers that the breweries used to employ to gather the annual harvest in the hop gardens. This yearly migration was such an old established part of cockney life that songs were sung about it. We're all going up, been up in down in Kent. We're all going up, been to help to pay the rent. We're an E-I-O, E-I-O, E-I-O. The song never made the charts, and mechanisation has pushed the Cockney hop pickers into history. But happily, not the horses. Horses have become such a rare sight in modern cities that two of them pulling a brewer's dray take on the splendour almost of a cavalcade. Yet even after World War II, London had so many horses that they were banned from some streets for causing traffic jams. They simply had to go to make way for the lorries that were ten times more cost effective. They were not so much phased out as wiped out. Between 1946 and 1948, a quarter of a million horses were slaughtered in Britain. Obsolete, uneconomical, time-wasting. Everything that they delivered so patiently for so many years was suddenly carried by motor vehicles. Coal and railway goods, bread and milk, and barrels of beer. Eventually, it was two brewers who worked out that if horses were used on short journeys, with lots of stopping and starting, they were actually cheaper than lorries. And that's how heavy horses came to be seen again in the streets of Britain. Totters, who make money out of the things that the rest of us discard, have been trading by horse and cart ever since junk was invented. They're among the last people still using horses purely for working but the bells they ring may soon toll their end. The crushing problem for totters is the demand for land in the cities. Most small stables have been briskly demolished to be replaced by bigger buildings. And you can't keep a horse in a block of flats. As horse traffic grew to a peak, the demand for stabling was so great that stable blocks were built on three or four floors, the beginning of multi-storey car parking. Masses of fodder had to be brought into the cities and there were immense problems of pollution. In London, sailing barges carried hay upstream and manure downstream to the farms and market gardens. Horses that worked in the cities didn't enjoy long lives. Even when there were water troughs for them to drink at, many owners wouldn't use them for fear of disease. Amongst the hardest worked were those that pulled the buses and trams. Every stop had to be followed by a start when the horses had to lean in to take the weight and get the wheels rolling again. In the 1880s, every progressive town and city had horse-drawn trams, until they were finally abandoned with the arrival of electrification. But on the Isle of Man, they stuck to their old-fashioned trams. Now, they're the very last in the world, and they possess a curiosity value that far outweighs their usefulness as a means of public transport. It seems something of a paradox that horses survive here simply because they're a tourist attraction. Visitors fly in jet aircraft to start their holidays with all possible speed and then board the trams to amble along the promenade at the best pace that a horse can manage. A gentle trot once the wheels are rolling nicely. 
Perhaps these space-age passengers want to experience what it used to be like to be beside the seaside. And nobody hurried beside the sea. The horses are content enough. There are 70 of them to keep the schedules, and all they have to do is keep between the lines. The few horses that now pull holiday makers along what's left of Britain's canal system are all that remain of an era of real horsepower. Two hundred years ago, with great inventiveness, British engineers constructed the canals as fast as Irish navvies could dig them. They were the motorways of the 18th century. They brought great prosperity and gave work to the countless thousands of horses that were the only means of towing the barges. Two-thirds of the costs of operating a canal went on keeping the towpaths in a fit condition for the horses. Then came steam, which led to the railway building mania of the 1830s and the end of one of Britain's really great enterprises. The railways, though, used horsepower even more to carry goods and passengers to and from the stations. And away from the traffic jams, life in the days of horse transport must have been pleasant and tranquil. Nothing could move very quickly, and horses make a great deal less noise and stink than mechanical vehicles. When soldiers used horses, military movements had far more grandeur, dignity and style. Man's most abysmal misuse of the horse has always been in the folly and glory of war. Fortunately, Horses are no longer suitable for real conflict, but they remain superb for warlike spectacle and great state occasions. 